Spider-Man holds a special place in my heart. Does anyone else remember when the first Sam Raimi film was released in the summer of 2002? Well, I do. In fact, I was there, even if it was only on a whim. My family and I were at the theaters to see God knows whatever movie originally, but those plans fell through. So my father suggested just on a whim, remember? Hey, let's go see Spider-Man. Beforehand, I didn't know much about the character other than what I'd picked up from the first level of the PlayStation 1 game because I'd never progressed past that level with my infantile gaming skill. But when I left that theater in the summer of 2002, I had a new favorite superhero and role model. I became obsessed, to put it lightly. Almost 20 years later, I've been hosting a Spider-Man series on my Twitch channel, and I've stated that I would rank the games. Well, that series is all over. It was a blast, and it's time to rank them. As with all things, there's going to be bias here, so expect the same here as I, like all of you, are inherently biased. However, I am still going to pursue an objective-based ranking in which I put my personal feelings and experience with the game aside and judge it by how well made of a game it is. So that means there will be two lists here today, ladies and gentlemen. One list, the subjective one that contains my bias, and it will be portrayed in the template of tier ranking from Z to S to A to B to C to F. The other more objective based list will be in a top 16 template. So all 16 games ranked by number. So even though I just said it, say this again the objective list with no bias is the number ranking one and the subjective list with bias is the tier listing we have 16 games to get through and they are as follows spider-man spider-man 2 enter electro spider-man the movie game spider-man 2 the movie game and all of its various ports ultimate spider-man Spider-Man 3, the movie game, the last and next-gen versions, Spider-Man Friend or Foe, Spider-Man Web of Shadows, both the Amazing Allies edition and the next-gen variants, Spider-Man Shattered Dimensions, Spider-Man Edge of Time, The Amazing Spider-Man, the movie game, The Amazing Spider-Man 2, the movie game, Marvel's Spider-Man and Marvel's Spider-Man Miles Morales. Spider-Man 2 the movie game will be a special case in which I'll acknowledge some of the different versions I didn't play. The console, PC, PSP, and DS versions will get the nod here. The Game Boy Advance and the obscure mobile version aren't to be addressed because they don't fit the mold of the established quota of Spider-Man games. Did you get all that? <laughs> Alright, good. Now let's begin. Now this isn't a console game, and I've never played it a day myself personally. But it counts because normally console and PC ports of a game are similar enough to warrant comparison usually with the PC port coming out on top. That and the console port was a massive success. This game? In one of the grandest miracles, or should I say travesties, of the 21st century, the exact opposite occurred here. This is a PC port that's worse than the console version, and it's a bad movie game. I've still, to this day, no idea how they messed up this bad, but they did it. All they had to do was port the console version to PC and all would have been well. They could have even ported over the PSP version and it would have been better. On that note, Spider-Man 2's movie game has many different ports, all different from one another. There's a console version that I'm sure you know, it's the one that comes to your mind when you hear about this game. There's this horrible PC version that 
defies the norms of PC always having the better versions of games. The PSP version, which is the true sequel to the first movie game, gameplay-wise at least. The DS version, which is what you'd expect of a side-scroller downgrade. And the Engage version, which is a Nokia phone edition that's alright for being an early mobile game. Honestly, the different ports deserve, and I hate saying that word, a video of their own. So I'll stick to the PC version for now. It's stiff, it's scripted, and it's stripped down. If you've played the console version of Spider-Man 2, stay away from this version. Only disappointment awaits you. Stick to watching videos on this game as opposed to playing it yourself. It's dead last on the listing, and it might as well be the same on the tier listing, because this is going straight to F. This one hurts. I've always had a soft spot for this game, and I often brag about it being the first game I ever let's play. Okay. It's the Charles Jackson. But if I'm going to be honest, it's the weakest of the console Spider-Man games. Repetitive gameplay, decent graphics, flat level design, and an overall underwhelming experience coming off the success of the sandbox style games that began with Spider-Man 2 and improved with Ultimate Spider-Man and Spider-Man 3. The voice acting is okay, and at least the game is based heavily in the Sam Raimi-verse. That's not enough to save it. Playing as Spidey's rogue gallery is an interesting concept, but wouldn't it have served better to have done this in the sandbox style? I mean, seriously, think about playing with Sandman, Rhino, Scorpion, and the many other villains in this game in an open world New York. That would provide endless avenues of fun. This could have gone down as the absolute and undisputed best Spider-Man game out of them all. It would have been Ultimate Spider-Man cranked up to 11. Unfortunately, that's not how it happened and all we can do is wonder. Oh, and one more gripe. Why in the holy mother of holy ducks did they only include Electro and Carnage in the PSP version? That's silly and illogical. While I'm at it, why wasn't there a next-gen version of this game where they could have expanded on it further? You know, like how they did with Web of Shadows? Anyway, enough about this game. It's a C for me personally, and it's at number 16 here. On to the next. Another one close to my heart that I'm going to have to leave behind. I've forgotten how funny the dialogue is and how linear the gameplay is. The ability to make choices while not as broad as in the next-gen version is still present and makes for some interesting outcomes. There isn't much to expect from a stripped down version of the game, but this one still holds up well with satisfying beat em up gameplay and a varying setting. Give it a look before you judge it, that's what I got for you with this one. You'll be surprised at how much fun you can get out of this game. It's going into the B category for me. As a bonus, the Nintendo DS version of Spider Man 2's movie game plays the same way and is similarly ranking alongside this game for me personally, especially considering that it was a prototype of sorts for the Amazing Allies edition of Web of Shadows. I'll admit, nostalgia initially blinded me with this one. After playing through it again, it's taken some hits. While it is still a good game, it's clear as day they threw whatever they could together for the last gen version. It's so noticeable that the PSP handheld version is better than the PS2 console version. Things have been stripped down a good deal from Spider-Man 2 and Ultimate Spider-Man. The graphics are passable and the environment is bland. But what about the gameplay? It's okay. By that I mean enough to make for an interesting experience. 
There's a glitch where the story won't go on and you have to restart the game. And for your own sake, I pray you've saved. Because the biggest knock on this game is that there's no autosave. During my playthrough on Twitch, I had to restart the whole game twice over because I thought I could beat it in one go with no issues. There's also no level select, which I have to dock it for too. From the Sandman mission on, those levels are pretty fun. To be fair, even the next gen version lacks level select. Reacquiring the black suit is also locked behind a wall of getting every Spider-Man symbol in the city, something that's way too time consuming. On the topic of the symbiote, it adds a special layer to the game. You have to watch your rage and be ready to take the suit off before it consumes you. There are even levels that require it for the win. Well done, but why does it have to be so hard to get the thing back when we beat the game? I would have also liked the replay option for the game where you can use the black suit in the final battle against Venom to see who's really the superior symbiote host. All in all, good game. The PS2 slash Wii slash PSP version of Spider-Man 3's movie game. It's a B from me. The first movie game is a shaky one for me. I could never beat it back in the day and it even intimidated me. At one point, I couldn't even get past the warehouse where you chase down Uncle Ben's killer. This game was made in the mold of the PS1 Spider-Man games that came before it, but with next-gen level graphics. The combos are slick, swinging is slightly upgraded, and the overall controls are okay. The bosses have invincibility frames while you don't, what else is new? Something that will always drive me insane. I like the precedent that this one set of taking the movie story and expanding around it with other materials from Spidey's lore. This way, we get a vision of sorts of how Sam Raimi's iterations of certain villains would have gone down since they didn't happen in the movies. The Vulture's hideout was a bit annoying but once you get to the boss fight, you get to beat him down and it's rewarding as ever. There's a stealth factor too when you're in the shadows and this is a necessity to master when you get to the ridiculously dreadful Oscorp levels. That terror drone thing was a real thorn in my side and I even made a highlight of all my deaths and rage over on Twitch. Fighting the bosses is fun enough to warrant your mastery of the combos. Ben's Killer, Shocker, Scorpion, Vulture, and the Green Goblin make for a good rogues gallery of battles, and if you'd like to play them at will, you can, because there's level select. There's also bonus minigames like bowling and some combat training. It's a decent experience that shifts from too easy at times to too hard at other times. The first movie game gets a B from D. Charles Jackson. As a bonus, the true sequel to this game, the PSP version of Spider-Man 2's movie game, ranks equally. It was essentially a reskin of the first movie game with elements from the console version of its namesake. Mysterio is an actual boss in this version as well. There's a decent upgrade system. There's additional cutscenes that look better than the in-game cutscenes from the console version. The game also ridded itself of the stealth elements from the first movie game, a definite plus for gamers. All in all, the game comes off as a hybrid, a bridge if you will, between the first and second console movie games. It is also the final link to the PlayStation 1 style of Spider-Man gaming. the successor to the one that started it all in a good outing in its own right. You may be wondering why it's so high up then. Well, despite its improvements, the game still feels like it's lacking something that the first had. It also added frames where you're left wide open to fall to your death or get hit, even if you're using invincibility cheats. That one was a huge letdown for me considering how much I loved blitzing enemies in the first game with Captain Universe. 
This game brings back all the costumes from the first game and adds some new ones. The greatest feature has to be the Create a Spider feature that lets you choose your costume and three specific abilities. I always loved choosing the Carnage suit and giving myself invincibility, unlimited webbing, and enhanced strength or enhanced web swinging. Let's talk about the levels. Much of the same from the first, but now they have outside ground levels. Still, when swinging above, you can't fall down to the ground or you'll die. This was handled better in the first game because it was written into the plot. This game says screw all that, you can't touch the ground. The levels have been designed to require a better control of Spider-Man, but no new control implementations were made to accommodate the player in doing so. Still, it's a fun time and the addition of bosses that we missed out on in the first game is a welcome touch. Some of the levels can be frustrating, but still a good run. This game is both better and worse than the original. That being said, it's going into my A tier. This one may ruffle some feathers, but someone's got to do it. I personally did not like this game very much outside of the noir missions. And no, I'm not a Batman fanboy by any means. That's a video for another topic. The premise and all else you'd see looking in from the outside made it look like this would be an almost perfect Spider-Man experience. For a decade, I looked from the outside in and built certain expectations expectations that were shattered uh -huh, when I finally got around to playing the game and I know that's mostly my fault as well. The graphics are cool and they hold up well. I didn't expect an open world experience with this game or a sequel for that matter. I knew that much. However, there are some glitches that should have been found in testing or even patched out. This is a seventh generation based video game by which patches were becoming a norm. Maybe I was ready to be done with it, but I felt it dragged on a bit, especially in the last two levels. I don't like how scripted the controls are, and overall, it feels like a downgrade from games like Spider-Man 2, Ultimate Spider-Man, and especially Web of Shadows, because I just finished playing that one previously before I got to Shattered Dimensions. Another downer is how you have to buy certain capabilities that should be innate, like recovering while falling, something that's been a norm in most Spider-Man games that came before. Without turning this into a massive rant, Spider-Man Shattered Dimensions is a C for me personally. It could have and should have been much better than it actually was. Hopefully, the sequel fares better. Well, speaking of the sequel, this one fares a bit better. The story is more centralized, hosting only two Spider-Men who are voiced by the two most popular voice actors at that. For those who don't know, that's Christopher Daniel Barnes of the 90s Spider-Man series and Josh Keaton of the spectacular Spider-Man. The graphics hold up very well and could pass for being of today's crop. The controls have been switched up a bit and I prefer them in this game, honestly. Some of the combos I personally preferred were stripped from the last game, but this game has its own to show off. Still, the crowd control combos that were normal before are now a part of the adrenaline bar and can't be used as extensively as you'd like. Back to the story. They use it as a means of making the game harder by showing you easy routes and saying that temporal incursions are shifting things, I just find that really frustrating, especially when I'm speeding through and I get blocked by an invisible wall just so the game can make itself harder on me. It can be a little confusing as to where you want to go from time to time too. Worst of all was how you had to start all over again if you lost to a boss midway. These boss battles are long enough too and they all have way too many invincibility frames for my liking that can hit you at any time. That's a problem because you get stuck 
in animation while you're down and take long enough to get up to where the boss can hit you again. Health can be scarce as well. And the last game had these issues too, might I add. I just didn't want to linger too long on it. And did I mention that the glitches are in this one too? That's right, they didn't game test well enough again. That's unforgivable, especially considering the only way to escape these glitches is to die or restart from the last checkpoint. Look, I'm already going off too long here. Edge of Time is better than its predecessor, but that's not saying much. I'll give it a B still. Before you leave the comment on this one, I'm counting the last and next gen versions as the same game as they feature no major differences outside of minor graphic and loading time improvements. Now, I should also say, with this game, it only goes up from here. The mobile version actually ain't that bad either, but back to the point, this is a pretty good game. I especially liked the web swinging mechanic of using the left or right trigger for the correlating arm. The gameplay is mostly intact from the first with a few changes. Once again, no one from the movies put in the time to voice their characters or even provide their proper likeness for the roles. A personal bonus, for me at least, is the inclusion of Carnage as a villain as he's my favorite symbiote even if it doesn't really make too much sense to have him in when you don't have Venom. I should also say, I really like the voice actor for Spider-Man and Peter in this game. I think he should get more gigs as Spider-Man if the opportunity ever comes. On to the gameplay. It took some adjusting to get used to after playing the first, but it holds up well. The combat and upgrade system is similar to the first game, with the exception of the Spider-Sense colors being switched in regards to what you can and can't dodge. Red is for dodging now, whereas it was white in the first game. As was the case with Edge of Time, this game makes some of the features that were innate into upgrades, like throwing big items at groups of enemies. I will never understand why games go backwards like that. If you're a dev and you're listening to this, stop doing this or just don't start to do it to begin with, please. The stealth combat has also been nerfed, something that's a big knock. Before, you could play like Batman and take everyone out from the shadows and use your abilities as Spider-Man in a different way than running into a group and taking everyone down via your spider sense, agility, and power. You can still use stealth takedowns in this game, but only one enemy at a time and even then it's easier to get caught now with no surefire way to escape to obscurity because they remove the retreat action. The web swinging and web zipping has been revamped to polarizing effect. Before, you could web sling from anywhere as your webs went straight up to the sky, and the same courtesy was extended to your web zipping. Now, you sling from buildings and you get to use both triggers on your controller to determine the hand you use for the swing. This is a great improvement because it allows for greater control and they even give you speed upgrades along with a slingshot mechanic for covering distance. However, the map for New York isn't designed well enough for you to maintain your swing when high up in the skylines. That and the delay on when you can cast a web derail the swinging a bit. The web zipping has been painfully nerfed. You used to be able to zip to literally any free point, and Spidey would do the necessary acrobatics and moves to reach that point. Now it comes off as being more scripted in the same vein as Shattered Dimensions and Edge of Time, with how you can only zip to certain points, and how you have to freeze time more often than not to find a point. As the game went on, I really started to adapt and enjoy it for what it is. A good story, that might be better than the films. Good voice acting, good graphics, and if I'm correct, one of the last movie games meaning that this game is the end of an era. It was nostalgic playing it, and the promo I made for it, which you can view over on my Instagram under the same username, the Charles Jackson, really makes me feel some kind of way. This is a good game. Not as good as the first movie game, 
but a good game nonetheless. I would have loved an Amazing Spider-Man 3 movie and game to round things out. The Amazing Spider-Man 2 the movie game gets an A. Bit of a love-hate relationship with this one. It's a good game, but it has some glitches and some broken mechanics that will kill your vibe. But again, this is one of the earliest games on the PS3. It came out in 2007. Some of the levels toward the end are borderline unfair and impossible without the perfect conditions too. That being said, I still love the game. It's the last hurrah from the Raimi cast and they do a good job in voicing their characters. The game differs a bit from the last gen version too. The setting is done better in this version and so is just about everything else outside of two things. The first is the black suit. In the last gen version, the symbiote was a part of the game's learning curve in that you had to pace your use of it and not be absorbed by it. In this game, similar to the movie, you keep it on as Spider-Man until he loses it later. However, the next gen version salvages this by allowing another run through of the game with the black suit on the entire time. The last gen version strips you of the suit and forces you to collect every figurine in the city before you can access it again. In this next gen version, after you beat the game twice, you'll have the option to switch between the red and the black suit through the pause menu. The second thing this version of the game is lacking is the mad bomber rooftop battle and the Morbius storyline. The Morbius arc in particular was a great part of the last gen version of the game that heavily involved the symbiote as a means of overcoming both Morbius and Shriek. The game manages to do the plot better than the film did, juggling a great rogues gallery into its world. The web swinging in this game doesn't get enough credit. You can really move in this game when you've got the momentum and your webs stick to the buildings. The web zip is almost as great as it was in Ultimate Spider-Man, having little to no limitations, especially in the black suit. You can even swing with both hands with the right button combos. Combat is good enough to pass and as you upgrade, you can really do some massive crowd control damage. The black suit upgrades you in every way, turning you into a near unstoppable tank, though not to the extent that it does in the last gen version, where you get stronger as you use the suit. You can even play as the new goblin in this game, and he's pretty fun to use. Speaking of the new goblin, outside of being able to play as him, in this version of the game you get a legitimate boss battle with him that mirrors the movie. It can go on as long as you can prolong it. You guys can go all over the city, he will follow you no matter where you go trying to kill you. Whereas in the last gen version of the game, it was more so of a big quick time event. I, like you stayed on the streets, maybe you went up toward buildings for certain parts, but that was it. The boss fights are fun, and you can even yo-yo Spidey in this game. Overall, it's an underappreciated outing that only lacks level select, and that's a problem because the levels at the end of the game, again, just like in the last gen version, are very fun, and it's a pain playing back up to that point just to play them again. Spider-Man 3's next-gen version is going into my A-tier. The granddaddy of these all that made them ultimately possible. Finally, a 3D game where you got to swing around and beat up bad guys. Indoor levels where you could utilize your advantages as Spider-Man. Graphics that still hold up in the comic sense today. Voice acting that gets you pumped and ready to get the job done. And it has level select. It has different costumes or respective abilities. It has a gallery for reading up on your favorite characters. It has cheat codes. It has the rogues gallery. It has solid level design. It has a plot good enough to be a movie. Most of all, has replay value. 
a replay value that has extended over 20 years past its heyday. It was my first ever PlayStation 1 game, and I still pop this sucker in and play it on my own time because of how great it's been to me. I'm probably missing some things too because this game has much to offer you, even if it is an old PS1 game. Easy S tier. Hands down, the most underrated Spider-Man game out there. You'd think that being the third outing from Phoenix after Shattered Dimensions and Edge of Time, that it would be stuck in that vein. But no, it transcends them both and goes in its own brilliant direction to every degree. The story takes place after the movie and provides us with insight as to what happened before. Remember that at the time of the game's release, it came out before the movie did. Only adding to the spectacle, upon seeing the movie, the game becomes even better. The gameplay is to die for. Before the PlayStation 4 Spider-Man game, this game was Spidey fans' versions of an Arkham game. Open world, amazing combat, solid use of webbing, reliable spider sense, Perfect stealth utilization, a great rogues gallery, beautiful setting, brilliant fluent movement, immersive voice acting, gorgeous graphics, and much more. I love this game, and there's a reason it runs so expensive now. It's overlooked because of being a movie game for a bygone era of Spider-Man, but let me tell you, to bypass that wall and get this game for yourself. It's a thrilling and worthwhile experience where you feel like Spider-Man. Welcome to the S tier, my old friend. Arguably the best Spider-Man game there is, especially considering that it was the last one that all gamers got to experience. Web of Shadows somehow ups the stakes and ante from its predecessors and delivers a joyride of a Spider-Man game. Great comic-friendly graphics, fast-paced gameplay, dynamic combat, an unmatched storyline with branching decision-making, good voice acting, a massive, destructible New York, a great rogues gallery, and everything else you can imagine. This might just be the definitive Spider-Man experience. You can even switch to the black suit at will. The upgrade system changes the game for the player, turning you into a juggernaut in your own right. Best of all, this is the only Spider-Man game, and get ready for this, where you can block. That and you still have your spider sense. You can't beat that. Ultimately, this game feels like Spider-Man 2's movie game, Ultimate Spider-Man, and Spider-Man 3 all wrapped into one. It's a shame we never got that sequel. Another easy S tier here. do you get when you smash Spider-Man 2's movie game up with Hulk Ultimate Destruction? You get this. Oh my goodness. They did their thing with this title. I remember seeing it advertised in gaming magazines back in 2004 as coming in 2005 with a still image of Spidey swinging through New York. Super Bam Bam and I were pumped. It came out and surpassed our expectations. The movement is fluid, the combat is impactful, the story is brilliant, the voice acting engages you, the setting immerses you, and the graphics still hold up, considering they're meant to look like a comic. You feel like you're playing multiple issues in the Ultimate Comics with this game. Even the music is all that. I know you hear it in the background right now, it's my favorite one. 
Playing as Spider-Man is slick and smooth. You can do what a spider can, and that's all we ask. Playing as Venom is like playing a different game. You might as well be the Incredible Hulk with all the chaos you can cause, and you can expect some challenging fun. The suit is always consuming you, so you have to feed it by draining the life force from others. You have a massive leap and an assortment of moves to use against unfortunate enemies. The game only gets better as you get in deeper, and the final two levels are Apex Spider-Man gaming. This game is what we want from every game we get. Fun Factor. It's worth noting too that this game is my own personal favorite of all the Spider-Man games. Also, you often hear me talk about how Friend or Foe was the first game I let's play. However, Friend or Foe was not the first game I played for YouTube or online. That was this game, Ultimate Spider-Man, back in 2009. Hey. I'm B. Charles Jackson. Ultimate Spider-Man is an S. It would be a Z, but that's a category I'm leaving all to itself, putting my bias aside, remember, if you know what I mean. I don't want to oversaturate the Z tier. The number three spot belongs to the Spider-Man 2 movie game from 2004. This game had zero business being as innovative, immersive, and flat out good as it was and still is. We could not believe it back then, and we almost still can't believe it so many years later. A sandbox style Spider-Man game where you can actually swing around the city in full with practically no restrictions? It was like we were living in the future. The story was based around the film, of course, but it was enhanced by what the devs built around that plot. More villains and more issues for Peter Parker in his life as a superhero. The combat was on point, the movement system was fluid, the graphics were stellar for their time, they even got more of the cast to voice their characters from the movie. A real gem that was way ahead of its time and has earned all praises sung on its behalf. It's still considered the best game by some, but for me personally, it's an A. The game is amazing, but it has been surpassed, and I don't mean by the PS4 game solely. I personally have Ultimate Spider-Man and Web of Shadows as all-around improvements on what this game started. The big one for me too, is that I feel this game lacks in the replay department, with the way this story was, I'd much rather have level select, and I don't feel it necessary to play through the game over again to get to certain levels as I would for, say, Ultimate Spider-Man. Surprisingly sitting at the number two spot as opposed to number one is Marvel Spider-Man Miles Morales the sequel of sorts to Insomniac's first Spider-Man outing. Given that you're playing as a different, less experienced Spidey, it's expected that the gameplay would be shaken up. The plus side is that you get some bonus powers that Peter Parker doesn't have, but at the cost of Parker's fighting experience, web-swinging ability, and gadgets. It seemed like an excuse to nerf things down, a good one, but still an excuse. The game also has a few glitches and issues that weren't present in the first. If I'm being honest, the game feels more like it should have been an expansion pack to the first game as opposed to being a new game of its own. The story, characters, and just about everything else is on point, but there's something missing from this sequel. Something that's hard to put into words. It's like how Inner Electro feels both better and worse than the first PS1 Spider-Man. The PS4 and PS5 versions are only differentiated by the graphic quality and load times. Apex Spider-Man gaming here is still, but a subtle step down from the first of its kind. The next game, however, is looking to be the best yet, and we're all waiting by the day. Miles Morales gets an A, and not an S for the reason that I have no real desire to play it again.
Taking the number one spot is Spidey's big return to gaming, Insomniac Spider-Man. This game not only lived up to the hype, it blew it away. Spider-Man 2 was the king of the hill for years in many fans' minds and hearts, even with the release of Ultimate Spider-Man and Web of Shadows, but this game promised and delivered the best Spider-Man experience. The devs looked back at the best the past Spidey games had to offer and gave it their own distinct touch to go. The story, the characters, the gameplay, the graphics, the DLC, everything in this game is cranked up to 11 from the games of the past as those limitations are long gone. You almost forget those limitations even existed. I remember the level they showcased before release with the helicopter and everyone, including myself, criticized it for appearing scripted. Many were excited for the game and many others were both speculative and cynical. Spider-Man 2 set the bar so high that we never thought anything could surpass it. I'm glad to report that this game did the impossible. And best of all too, the replay value is all there. Even if you just want to swing around the city and enjoy the setting while feeling like Spider-Man, it's all yours. The only downside is that the game was exclusively for PlayStation 4. It's too bad the rest of the flock didn't get it, but the PS4 was the console to have anyway. If you've played every other game in the series, like yours truly, you'll easily notice the elements from them all layered throughout this gem of a masterpiece. Remember how I praised the Amazing Spider-Man movie games? Clearly, the devs saw the same thing and framed this game in the same way as those. The camera angles, web zip system, and healing abilities are just a few of the imported features from the Amazing Spider-Man duology. Remember how you had different costumes with differing abilities in the PS1 Spidey games, which revolutionized Spider-Man games as a whole? Remember how the first movie game had a solid combo system that could phase almost every enemy? Remember how Spider-Man 2 revolutionized the genre again and created a true sandbox Spider-Man experience? Remember how Ultimate Spider-Man improved on Spider-Man 2 with better controls and new mechanics for combat and web swinging? Remember Spider-Man 3's police dispatch lady? its quick time events, and its huge map of New York? Remember friend or foe's wide variety of characters and broad lore connected to other Spidey mediums? Remember Web of Shadows, hilarious dialogue, brilliant upgrade system, destructible environment, and fast-paced action? Remember how Shattered Dimensions birthed a new Spider-Man storyline that affected actual canon while also showing the effectiveness of linear leveling? Remember how Edge of Time innovated Spider-Man storytelling and produced timeless graphics while honing what its predecessor did? Remember how the amazing Spider-Man gave players a smooth experience where you felt completely in control? Remember how the amazing Spider-Man 2 revamped web swinging and added a healing ability? Yeah. Me too. And this game does all of that, but better. And that wasn't even everything. Everything I just said there, I could make a video on all of the things they brought over and made better, and I haven't even touched on the things that they added themselves. These new features include the free fall, the cinematic parkour, the liveliest open world we've ever had, and so much more. It's unanimous. Everyone loves this game, and rightfully so. The only question is if it's better than its sequel Miles Morales, but that's all up to the individual player. On the subjective tier, this is the one. This game is the one and only Z for TCJ. The undisputed king of Spider-Man games 
and it looks to be holding that title for a long time to come, at least until the true sequel comes, which I've got to say I'm very excited for because I hear we're going to be able to play as Peter and Miles and much more is coming. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed. Please subscribe to my channel for more. There will be much more, I promise. Come check me out on Twitch. Same name. Same name on everything. Over on Instagram. Twitter a little different though. That's TC Jackson 09. I'll see you next time, all right? This video is long overdue too. I was supposed to rank these games after I finished the series way back in, I believe it was the end of April is when I finished Miles Morales. I'll let you know right now, I am currently recording this at 8.30 in the morning. I'm ending right now on September 5th. And I finished this at the end of April, but it is what it is, right? I'll see y'all next time. And I hope y'all are enjoying that 70s heavyweight division too. That took forever. After this video, I'll probably make another boxing video. It'll probably be on something to do with the 80s is all I'm gonna say. All right, this has been, we're gonna do it different this time. Oh geez, remember this. <clears throat> D. Charles Jackson, bitch. All right, peace.